come out on such a beautiful day when you could be sleeping or what not the other. I appreciate it very much. Uh, we are going to get in the weeds a bit today, <laughs> as if we don't always, uh, but particularly so. But I think this, I'm going to close this little bit so we don't get quite as much clear. We have people that are taking their pictures that want to come join and, and they knock on the door insisting to get in, we'll let them in. Uh, I think this is a particularly important session, though in some ways it's just going to frame what we say later. But you need to know some of this background in order to duly understand what we're going to talk about next week and certainly the week after that, thinking on down the road some. Um, and I think you will recognize some of these points. You will have heard some of these points and maybe in different contexts than we're going to talk about them today. But you are, oh, I've heard somebody say something like that before. And I want you to know where that comes from, where it comes from in the history of the church. That, that's important to know. Uh, because what did someone say? Does, was it Winston Churchill said, if we forget history, we're bound to repeat it. Somebody said that <laughs> or something like that. And that's true of the church as well. Uh, so we begin today with the extremely important topic of the atonement. This is the very heart of Christianity. Is there is a reason that the cross is the most prominent and the most recognizable symbol of Christianity the world over. Because there is where the most important work that Jesus did was accomplished. And that is the atonement for human sin. And I say this is Christ's most important work. Because as the theologian Leon Morris has written, by the way, if you've never read Leon Morris, you should. Uh, and, he, and I quote him, the atonement is the crucial doctrine of the faith. Unless we are right here, it matters little what we are like elsewhere. So this is really, really important. Furthermore, it is in what happened here at Calvary that Christian theology becomes personal, if you will, where more objective aspects of Christian doctrine, which we've talked about already in this study, the nature of God, the nature uh, of sin, uh, the nature of Christ himself, of human beings and their relationship to sin. It is here, it is in the atonement, that those doctrines stop being out there and they become subjective where they cease being merely academic or theoretical, and they begin to have direct application to our spiritual lives, not to say to our eternal destinies. The cross, then, and the atonement that it represents uh, is where the theological rubber meets the road, to use a phrase. What is more, and this is important to understand, and we're going to talk quite a bit about this as we go forward, the atonement is the nexus of Christian theology, by which I mean this. This is where all of the doctrines of the faith come together. They all spiral in here in a cohesive way so that we begin to see and appreciate the beautiful symmetry, the systematic nature, the interconnectedness of Christian doctrine. This is where we begin to say, ah, now I know why that's important. Ah, I'm, now I know why that is important that I understand that. It's where we come to appreciate that what we believe about God, which we talked about for, for three months, what we believe about Christ, what we believe about human beings, what we believe about sin, all of that necessarily colors our view of what happened here. Uh, and then again, the view we take of the atonement will itself have ramifications on a host of other Christian doctrines that we're going to talk about if, if God is good and I'm still here and you're still here. We're going to talk about it in the years ahead. When I say the years, I mean a couple of years, right? We're going to talk about salvation. What is salvation? What is entailed? We're going to talk about the nature of the church. The, the atonement has absolute <laughs> interconnectedness to all of that. And to illustrate that interconnectedness of which I speak, consider this. 
If we understand God, and, and again, we talked about this two years ago. If we understand God to be a completely holy, righteous, set-apart being, we talked about this morning, right? Even some in our sermon. Who demands that human beings created in his image be nothing less than holy as he himself is holy, which he does. That's a scripture, as you know. Then we will tend to think and say, well, it's very difficult for us to satisfy the demands of such a God. Which will make it necessary in our thinking that something will have to be done on our behalf <laughs> to satisfy our sins before God. That's one way of thinking about the atonement. But it's directly related to what we think about God. But on the other hand, and this is increasingly common in our society, just Open Facebook, if you dare. I never look at Facebook. Don't have a Facebook account. Never lost any thumb thing on Facebook. Don't find it on Facebook. And what April does show me, I go. <laughs> <laughs> the intellectual crucifixion of America. But on the other hand, if we understand God to be lenient, to be permissive, even indulgent, if we think of God as some grandfatherly type who says, well, you know what, those kids are just human after all. And we've got to let them have a little fun sometimes. Let's just lighten up a little bit. Well, if that's how we tend to think about God, and there are plenty of people who sit in pews in churches all over America, some of them right here in River City, who absolutely think of God that way. That he wouldn't send any hell? What is that? No, God wouldn't send anybody to hell. He just wants us to love him. You know that, right? That is very, very common. If that's your view of God, guess what? You're going to think that all that's required of the atonement is for God to give us a good example to follow in Jesus Christ. Just show us the way, perhaps a little inspiration and a little nudge, but that's all we need. We can do it on our own. Plenty of people who think that. But that's all related to what we view about God. Similarly, if we understand Jesus Christ to have been merely a human being. And there are plenty of people in our churches today who believe that Jesus Christ was just a human being. That he was not God in the flesh. That's impossible. He was just a, a, a human like we are. An exemplary human being. A marvelous human being. Better than we are for sure, but a human being. Well, then we will think that all the work he did, including the atonement, just serves as an example to the rest of us human beings. Merely being one of us, he's not really capable of offering anything to God on our behalf other than to show us a better way to live. He can be our life coach, to use a contemporary term. Conversely, though, if we understand Christ to be God in the flesh, fully God and fully man, then his work is capable of going infinitely beyond what a human being can do on our behalf. And then we will hold that his atoning work served not only as an example for us, but as a sacrifice on our behalf and in our place, which is a completely different matter. Finally, if we understand human beings ourselves to be basically good people, have you heard that before? Yeah, basically good people. He has a good heart. I hope no one ever says, I don't think anybody ever has said of Randy he has a good heart. But if they did, they would be absolutely wrong. He does not. I know Randy's heart. It is not good. But it is not good, and it's not good all the time. I hate to say that. But I'm, guess what? I know something about your heart, too. It ain't good. None of us are. Isn't that what Jesus said? I know what is in human beings. I know what is in man. And what did he say? It ain't good. So just take his word for it if you don't believe me. But if we believe, and there are people, a lot of Christians who believe we're basically good people, good hearts, then we will probably think that with a little effort, just a little more effort, we can fulfill what God demands of us. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. In such a case, all we really need in way of atonement is a little instruction, a little example, a little motivation, and... We can do it ourselves. But at the other end of the spectrum of human beings, if we think of fallen humanity as totally depraved, which is what we talked about a few months ago when we talked about the doctrine of man, 
and we consequently think that man is unable to do what is right and what is holy, no matter how hard he tries, that he always fails. If we believe Paul when he says there's nothing good in man, <laughs> he doesn't do one thing right, if we believe that, then we will tend to think that the atonement must be a more radical work on our behalf, and again, something that must be done for us. So you see what I mean? What we view about all those important doctrines comes home to roost. Right here. Comes home to reset here. So not surprisingly then, over the long course of, of Christianity, over 2,000 years, various theories reflecting these different understandings of God, of Christ, of man, have arisen. And they all try to account for what Christ actually did at the cross. So it's our task this afternoon, uh, and then we're going to spend three weeks on the atonement. But just to sort of set the stage, and I, as I said, I think this is important, I want to briefly survive, survey five of the most important of these theories. And I have to say, I almost skipped this lesson and thought, well, this is a really a little in the weeds for the book. But no, you need to know what people have thought in history, because then you will recognize it when you hear somebody say something, oh, that's not a new idea. In fact, it's an old heresy, right? And that's, that's maybe a good thing to know. But before we dig into those weeds, let us pray, shall we? Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to talk about five theories of the atonement that have been popularized throughout Christian history. And the first of those theories that we want to consider is one that sees the atonement as an example. I was mentioning as an example. This is often called the Socinian theory, and it's simply that because uh, the 16th century theologian whose name is associated with this theory was a man named Faustus Socinus. He first developed this teaching, but it's with us today. It is with us today in a group called the Unitarians. Have you ever heard the Unitarians? Well, they are direct descendants of this, the adherents, I should say, of this theology. So it's very much alive and well today. And you will recognize some of this, although they would not call themselves so Socinians, you will recognize some of this theology in those people in more liberal churches who think of <coughs> Jesus, uh, the atonement, as example. That's all we really need is a little help along the way. So this is a fairly well, uh, widespread uh, held position. So, Socinians... He rejected any notion of a substitutionary satisfaction by Christ on the cross. So Sunians hold that the real value of Jesus' death at Calvary is its service to you and I as a beautiful, perfect illustration or example of the kind of total dedication and love to God we are all to practice. Jesus gave his life for the cause of God, and so should we. That's the example. That's its value. And for biblical proof of this, the Socinians point to one scripture. 1 Peter 1, 2.21. And it reads this way. To this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you, and what? An example so that you might follow in his steps. And the Socinians, and there it is. That's the whole point of the cross, to leave us an example so that we might live in the same way. Yes, sir. I don't mean to interrupt, but yep. we did cover that extensively in Sunday school uh -huh. because the Greek is mistranslated, for example. Yeah. It's actually a template, and it, the, the Greek word is hupogromon, mm -hmm. and it's a, a template uh, and not an example. Right. So um, it's a mistranslation from, right. from what I understand. Right. right. So Sinus, though, built his idea on that mistranslation. And so the Unitarians, that the point of Christ's sacrifice for us was as an example, and I think so Sinus would say as a template of how we're to live. Right? I, I think that's how he, he would say it. Now, there are several related doctrinal conceptions which undergird this Socinian view that we need to say. First of all, any Socinian, a person who holds this position, 
has a very high view of humanity. They really do. They think we're pretty good darn people. <laughs> they conceive of human beings not as totally depraved, not as hopeless sinners, but essentially as spiritually intact beings. Certainly capable, morally capable, of filling, fulfilling God's requirements on our own. God has not asked us to do anything which we are not perfectly capable of doing on our own. That's one thing. Second, they deny that God is a God of retributive justice. That God is not going to mete out any justice or punishment. God is not some ogre in the sky who demands some sort of satisfaction from or on behalf of those who sin against him. He's simply a God of love, and he's there to help us along the way. And third, they hold that Jesus, and this is clear, this is why we talked about all that at the beginning. They must hold that Jesus was merely a human being. He was not God. His death on the cross was therefore simply the death of an ordinary human being. And this, they saw, they followed the Arians. We remember we talked about the Arians who believed Jesus was uh, a the highest of creature, but a creature nonetheless. He was a human being. Uh, so it, the atonement then is important not in some supernatural way to Socinians, but simply, as I said, as the supreme example uh, in their thinking, in the Socinians thinking, of a human being doing what God requires of him or her. And they say, Jesus himself taught us what it was required of man. And that is to what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And they say, there it is, and Jesus showed us what kind of love that is. But, but or taught us what that love is. But so Simeon say he didn't just teach it, but rather on the cross, he showed us what that looks like in, in everyday terms. He showed us a perfect illustration of what he taught. He didn't just speak it, preach it, <laughs> he lived it and showed it on the cross. Okay, so from the Socinian perspective, what does the atonement do for us then? Well, it satisfies two human needs, universalists, uh, Unitarians, I should say, insist. First, it provides the quintessential example, as I said, of the kind of total love for God any person who wishes to be saved must himself or herself display. We must be totally dedicated to God and follow his example if we're going to be saved. And second, his death, they say, provides the inspiration to love in that way. Why would it provide the inspiration for another human being to love in that way? Remember, Jesus was only human. So how would he inspire us to love like he loved? What would be inspirational about that? His example. example. Yeah, example. And the idea is, Jesus was human. If he can do it, guess what? I can do it. Because he was nothing more than I am. He was a human being just like I am. And if he can do it, we all can do it. We all can love. He just, you know, that, so that's the idea. So, you see what I mean. Uh, and there are people who... Certainly believe this, as I said, who are, are meeting while you're looking, you know, the Unitarians. This is what they teach. This is what they believe about God, about human beings, and about sin. Now, if you've been with us in previous classes, I trust, I needn't tell you, that we do not hold to this, or the doctrinal conceptions that undergird it. The, the scriptures speak quite differently of Jesus' death. They speak of it in terms of a ransom, of a sacrifice, of the bearing of sin, and the like. And it's interesting, and I bet you talked about this in your Sunday school class. It is true, and it may be a mistranslation, but in most English versions, including this is the English Standard Version, so this is a fairly up-to-date translation. Uh, it is true that Peter says... To this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He did say that. But guess what? Just three verses later, in the exact same chapter, this is what he writes. Christ himself 
bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Right? Quoting, of course, the Old Testament in that particular place. But you see, that's what happens when we take verses out of context. And I'm sure you talked about it. You take that. He died as an example, but just... just if you just keep reading long enough, I mean, you could do this while you're waiting at the red light. If you just keep reading, you will see that Peter can't possibly mean that because they say, Son, Jesus wasn't just an example on the cross, he bore our sins on the cross, which gets to an idea, of course, that we will talk about later. That clearly teaches something different. So, but that's one theory, and I just wanted you to know, and it's still around today, and it still informs people's thinking, even in more liberal churches who. Don't know anything about Faustus Socinus. You know, you can tell them that. They would look at you like a cow looking at a new gate or whatever that's for. <laughs> but but that's that's where they get it. They just don't know it. All right. Well, let's move on. If the Socinian theory of the atonement sees it as an example of how we should love God, then the second theory I want to bring to your attention, and this is called the moral influence theory. Uh, sees the atonement as a demonstration of how God loves us. The Socinians see it as an example of how we should love God, and the moral influence people see it as a demonstration of how much God loves us. Uh, now, the Socinian view we just talked about emphasized the humanity of Christ, right? That he was like us. The moral influence theory, first developed by a medieval French philosopher pictured here, Peter Abelard, emphasized Christ's divine nature. So think about that. So Sinians go too far on the human side, and here we go. The pendulum swung all the way on the side, and the moral influence people, they want to emphasize Christ's divine nature, the fact that he was God. And Abelard taught that by his death, Christ did not make some, again, some kind of sacrificial payment. He didn't, he didn't do that. He didn't try to satisfy God's moral dignity on the cross, which had been so offended by man's sin. But rather, according to Abelard, Jesus' death demonstrated to sinful man just how much God loves him. Now, have you heard that before? Yeah, of course, we do talk about that, that the cross demonstrates how much God loves us. But Abelard said, this is it. This is, the, this is the meaning of the atonement as a demonstration of God's love. And I say this theory of the atonement originated way back in the, in the 12th century. And you need to know that it didn't catch on in the 12th. People, no, no, no. And it kind of just <laughs> went into the mothballs for a long time until it was resurrected 700 years later. In the 19th century, remember what, we keep repeating the same mistakes, 700 years later, it was resurrected and it's le in Europe and in America. And its leading proponent in the United States, I hate to say it, was an American Congregationalist minister <laughs> named Horace Bushnell, who's pictured here. Now, that, I don't think that's a very good picture of Horace. His teeth don't really look like That's a beard that's messed up there. It's kind of looks like a Halloween figure. But you get the idea. That's Horace, an uh, American congregational minister. Uh, he died in 1876. So the same year that uh, if you go and look at our lectern in the sanctuary, our lectern was built in 1876, the same year that Bushnell died. Those, like Bushnell who hold the moral influence view of the atonement, well, they maintain above all else, and this won't surprise you, that God's nature is essentially love. Love, 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 love. Now, they so emphasize that, and we all agree that God is love. The scriptures teach that. But they so emphasize the love of God that they minimize the other attributes of God. God is love, but that's not all God is, right? We've talked about that. He's a just God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. Even a wrathful God. And that's not just Old Testament, that's New Testament, right? We read in Hebrews that we're to be careful that we're not consumed by the wrath of God. Now, since in their view God is essentially love, though, the moral influence people teach that human beings need not fear God. 
They don't need to fear his justice. They don't need to fear his punishment. Nothing they say in God's loving nature requires satisfaction for or rectification of our sins. He, he just looks over. We, he's the love, and his love just washes it away. According to their view, then, man's problem, our problem, is not that we violated God's law and therefore must be punished accordingly. No, no, they say. Man's problem is in his head. <laughs> Man's problem is in his attitude. Man's problem is his fear of God. Based on misinformation. <laughs> I hate to use that term. But based on misinformation. His failure to realize that God is love keeps him at arm's length from God. Keeps him apart from God. Keeps him alienated from God. Thus the difficulty lies in us not in God. And Christ came and he died to correct this defect in us by demonstrating how much God loves us. His death on the cross being just one, if certainly the most impressive one, of the ways that Christ demonstrated God's love throughout his earthly life. By, by healing the sick, by healing the lepers, you name it. By feeding 5,000 people a, you know, a free lunch on a Thursday afternoon, you name it. He showed us love in a thousand ways, but the greatest way was on the cross. And he just wants us to realize we have nothing to fear. Consequently, from the perspective of uh, those who espouse the moral influence theory, uh, the atonement is significant because it fulfills humanity's <coughs> three most basic needs. By the way, they point to this scripture as, as, as part of proof for all this. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, or, you know, that's it. He just wants us, we're lost in our thinking, lost in our attitude about God. Well, they say that uh, Jesus' death fulfills humanity's three most basic needs. First, the need of an openness uh, to God, which is to say, uh, I don't know where I am in my notes here for some reason. Well, let's just keep going. Maybe I'll get there. Get there. Yeah. Maybe I'll get there. Yeah, fulfills humanity's three most basic needs. And, and these are they. Uh, first, we need an openness to God, as I said. We need not fear God, which is to say the need uh, for an inclination to respond to his call to repentance and to be <laughs> reconciled to him. And the purpose of death, uh, of Christ's death on the cross was to eradicate, as I said, our fear of God. Now, that fear was exemplified, they say, in Adam and Eve. Remember what they did after they sinned? What's the first thing they did when God came looking for them in the cool of the day? What were they doing? They were hiding. And that's what Bushnell will say. Why were they hiding? Well, they were afraid of God. But God showed up, he said, to show you have nothing to fear. Now, I don't read exactly Genesis that way. It was a pretty nasty encounter. But he didn't exactly, where were you? I've been looking for you. But you know, that's what Bushnell says. Okay? So there's the fear, he says. And that's the, the problem that keeps us unreconciled to God is our own fear. So a second need is that is accomplished by the atonement is the need for a deep and personal conviction of sin, and a resultant repentance. Uh, and you might say, well, this, that seems strange. But the idea is it's not enough to be intellectually aware that we have broken God's law. No, conviction of sin must penetrate deeper and lead to heartfelt sorrow of what our sin has done to a God who loves us so much that he died for us. So it's the effect that our sin has on the God is what we're repenting of, not our sin itself. So you see, it's hope that once we look on him whom our sins have pierced, to use a biblical phrase, our hearts will melt and we will be influenced, moral influence theory, we will be influenced to turn aside from our fear and to turn to Jesus in love. We will be reconciled to him. We will embrace what he's trying to give us. You understand what they're getting at there. And third, they say, the atonement meets this need. 
Human beings need to be inspired. We need to ins be inspired to love in this way and to, and to love God. We don't need theological definitions of God. We so certainly do not need to be gathered on a Sunday afternoon in beautiful weather in here talking about all these definitions that we are talking about. We don't need that, said Bushdell. I will quote the Congregationalist minister. We want a friend whom we can feel as a man and whom it will be sufficiently accurate for us to accept and love. According to proponents of the moral influence theory, this need was met through the work done by Jesus Christ, especially in his death, in which Christ humanized God, humanized God, made him approachable by bringing him into our plane of existence and thereby demonstrating that, yes, after all, God is love, a God we need not fear, but we need to just embrace and be reconciled to in reciprocal love. Isn't that beautiful? Right. Both of these theories, the Socinian and the moral influence, where do they see the, the work of atonement is directed toward what? Human beings. It's all human centered. Mm -hmm. And that should be your first slide. Right? <laughs> it's all human centered. The atonement is about us and about us totally. How do we give us an example of how we're supposed to love God and thereby earn his uh, love? or to recognize his demonstration of love and be so influenced by our hearts melting in love for what he's done for us that we'd be reconciled. But it's all about us, all the way. Okay. Also, both of those views have a very specific view of God. How, do they, how would you say they characterize God, the Father? In both of those views, how is God presented? A loving teddy bear. Loving, I'm sorry? Loving teddy bear. A loving teddy bear. That's perfectly said. I can't improve on that. Yeah. A loving teddy bear. That, that's what God is. He's indulgent, is he? He's kindly. He's lenient. He's, a, as I said, a grandfather type figure who just wants to pat us on the head and send us on our way. And therefore, both of these views have, really teach that all that is required to, for, to be restored to his favor and good graces is either one, in the case of Socinianism, just do our best <laughs> to love like Christ loved, that's enough, or two, in the case of the moral influence theory, simply to respond to the love of God for us in a positive way. All right, but now we move to something that's a little different than either of those, and we, we're going to drag up somebody else from the history books here, another old white dead man. Uh, his name is Hugo Grossius. And he had a much different view of things. Uh, by training, Grotius was a lawyer. He was not a theologian. And that's going to become important in what we move forward and say. Uh, he was trained as a lawyer. And so <laughs> all this talk of a grandfatherly type, what do you say, teddy bear? Mm, <laughs> Grotius didn't go with that. He held God to be a holy righteous governor of the universe who has established certain laws. Dad, blame it. <laughs> he has established certain laws. Sin is by definition a violation of those laws. And violations or disregard of God's laws is serious business. We can't just look past it as the Socinians want to do, as the moral influence people want to do. Sin is not to be taken lightly. It must be dealt with. Right? You can hear a judge say amen. As Grotius saw it, those violations are not, however, an attack upon God's person. Now, that's important. It's not an attack upon God's person. It's an attack upon the administration of his laws. It's an attack upon him as an administrator of the universe, not a personal attack. Now, we, that's important. Thus, he says, God has a right as a ruler, as the governor of the universe. He has a right, indeed the responsibility, to punish sin. Violations of or rebellion against his rule of law. They must be punished. And if they're not punished, there's going to be chaos in the universe. 
Got it? That's his view. Though Grotius emphasized the holiness and righteousness of God, the ruler, the governor, he agreed, though, that God is primarily a God of love. Both can be true. And therefore, though as supreme governor of the universe, he has a right to punish each and every violation of his law, to punish sin, it's not necessary that he do so. He can choose to do something else. He can choose to forgive sins of humans and absolve them of their guilt. It's totally up to him as the ruler of the universe. He has the right to punish it, but he can choose to do something different. But the manner in which God chooses to forgive sin is the issue for a lawyer. Right? And you think you want, right? Because of justice. Because of justice. True, God can forgive sin, but according to Grotius' governmental theory, he must do so in a way that preserves the integrity of the moral government of the universe. If not, again, there's just going to be chaos. As a righteous ruler, as a holy ruler, God cannot simply ignore or overlook violations of the rules he has established. To do this, that is to forgive sins too freely, would result in the undermining of the law's authority and of its effectiveness. So he can punish sin, he can forgive, but if he's going to forgive, he must forgive in a way that maintains justice. So from Grotius' point of view, any atonement of sin must provide grounds for the forgiveness of sin and simultaneously retain the moral structure uh, of the government. Uh, moral structure of the universe, I should say. This he held Christ's death did. He met those two qualifications. But according to Grotius, Christ's death provided the grounds for the forgiveness of sin, not because Christ was punished for sins, God is love, but because Christ's death demonstrated God's justice. It demonstrated God's hatred of sin. A demonstration that was intended to do what? Induce in us a horror of sin. In other words, according to Grotius, Christ wasn't crucified to pay for our sins. He was crucified so that we might look at him on the cross and think, I better get my act together. I better get my act together. If I continue in my sin, that's what's going to happen to me. Because God is just. That's what I'm going to have to suffer if I continue to violate God's law. That totally strips Christ of his divinity. Mm -hmm. That one statement right there. Yeah, 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 it does. And so Grotius said, Christ's death isn't a punishment of sin at all. It's not. It's not a punishment of sin at all. It's simply a deterrent to sin. That's the word. The atonement, the cross, is meant to be a deterrent to sin. And if it has that effect in us, if beholding God's hatred of sin poured out on Christ, if we consequently turn from our sin, then we can be forgiven. And that turning, to use the theological word, that repentance becomes the ground of our forgiveness. But you see, it's not the kind of repentance we normally think of, right? It's a repentance that looks at the cross and says, I don't want to end up there. So, you know, out of sheer horror that it might happen to us, we turn to God and ask his forgiveness. And, but, but Grotius says this, is, this meets all the demands because the need for us to be punished has been eliminated because Christ has died. And yet, at the same time, God's moral government and the authority of the law have been upheld. So that's what he's really after. He's really after a way to forgive sins and yet maintain the moral structure of the universe. The problem, as we've already said in this, is that it sees the atonement as not a punishment for sin, but as a deterrent to sin. 
which is something quite a bit less than what the Bible teaches, don't you think? Now, the first thing that strikes one about this theory, how many scriptures did I put up in support of that? None. And that's not what Grotius did either. He was brilliant. He was brilliant. And he knew the scriptures, but he made no explicit scriptural basis for it because he could. It's a, it's a, and I don't, I don't want you to misunderstand when I say this is a brilliant theory. It is a brilliant theory, but that's just what it is. It's not based on scripture. It's based on logic. He was working more as a lawyer than as a theologian, which is why I pointed out that was his training earlier on. He doesn't use scripture. But he just uses general principles, scripture, uh, general principles from Scripture, from which he draws then his own inferences from those general principles. Uh, and now every other view that we're looking at cites specific scriptural references. We might not agree with the way they interpret them, but they cite explicit scriptural references that deal with the atonement, uh, or some way define atonement anyway. But the governmental theory works. Only inferentially, from general teachings of Scripture, that God is love, that we need to repent, that Jesus died on the cross, that, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, it was an example of what could happen to us if God poured out his wrath on us. All of those things are true, but the inferences he draws from them in terms of the atonement are not scriptural. Uh, it should be pointed out also that quite apart from itself not being based on explicit scriptural references, the governmental theory that we've just been talking about, and especially Grotius' insistence that Christ's death on the cross was in no sense a punishment for sin, contradicts explicit scripture. So he doesn't use explicit scripture, but his theory contradicts explicit scripture, and that's a problem. All we would have to do tonight, and I didn't I'll put this on the screen, is go to Isaiah chapter 53. And there we read what? Let me read it for you. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. It was a punishment for sin, right? He was crushed for our iniquities. It was a substitutionary punishment. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And there's this passage again, and with his wounds we are healed. So <laughs> that's the problem. There are no explicit scriptures to support this theory, and the theory itself denies the teaching of explicit scripture. So that in itself should lead us to believe, though we might admire the logic in it, it's an ill, <laughs> it's illogical scripture. All right, very well. We come now then to a consideration of what has been called the ransom of the atonement. I bet you've heard of this. And the reason I say that is because uh, this is the classic view of the atonement. When I say classic, I mean this. It dominated the church's thinking and teaching about the death of Christ for over a thousand years. So it deserves our close scrutiny. It's been around a long time, and it's been championed by some amazing intellects and some champions of the faith. Two major early developers of this theory were Origen. We've met his name before, the great church father Origen, born in 185, died in 253. And then also Gregory of Nyssa, about 335, 200 years later or so, to 395. Well, let's talk about what these church fathers taught about the atonement. Let's talk about that. Origen, to understand his view, you have to know, and he's not completely wrong about this. There's a, a very influential systematic theology that's been published in the last 20 years that sees uh, the scope of biblical history in exactly this, this way. But Origen conceptualized biblical history as a great drama. It's a great drama in which in a cosmic battle between the forces of good and evil, Satan somehow established control over humanity. He does not tell us how, but he says Satan established control over humanity and he became the prince of the power of the air. The governing power over this present darkness. And he's not completely wrong in that. <laughs> we can go to scriptures about that. 
the scriptures do teach that Satan is the ruler of this world. Now, that's used in a specific way, but it is scripture. As such, Origen taught, though, he goes on to talk, to teach from that, Satan has rights that cannot simply be ignored. And he said that because for God to ignore Satan's rights, he's become the governor of this world, and for his rights as the governor of this world to be just stolen from him would be unjust. It would be immoral, and far be it from God to do that. So God couldn't just take back what was rightfully Satan's, or had become rightfully Satan's. Consequently, according, according to Origen, humanity's major problem is its enslavement to evil. Its enslavement to evil. Its enslavement to Satan. So the question is, how shall man... Be free. Right? If that's his major problem, how shall man be free from Satan's tyranny and control? Well, Origen noticed that Jesus himself said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a what? Ransom for many. We sang a hymn this morning in church that had that alluded to this very scripture and point. A ransom for many. Moreover, St. Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 6.20 that Christians have been bought with a price. And St. Peter writes in his first epistle that believers were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So the ransom theory certainly does have scriptural support as far as that goes. It's not like the governmental theory. These are explicit references that say in some way the atonement was a ransom. Clearly then, if, if, if these scriptures are taken at face value, clearly then, Christ paid a ransom price for human sin. And what was that price? His own blood, right? His own blood. Here's the question. To whom was the ransom paid? The price was the blood of Christ. To whom was it paid? Origen concluded that the ransom price must have been paid to Satan. Mm. Whose servants we were. That's whose control we are. So if your child has been kidnapped and you pay a ransom price, who do you pay it to? Person who holds the job. Person. So he said, we were Satan's servants. The ransom price was paid to serve him. And he writes this on his commentary on the book of Romans. Uh, he says, now it was the devil that held us, to whose side we had been drawn away by our sins. He asked, therefore, as our price, the blood of Christ. He considered Christ to be a bigger prize. Notice then that in Origen's formulation of this theory, the ransom was determined by Satan, paid to Satan, and accepted by Satan. True enough, acknowledged Origen, in, its, in this cosmic transaction, if you will, Satan was deceived. Uh, but but Origen insisted that Satan deceive himself to think that he could be Lord over the soul of Jesus. He miscalculated, first of all. And second, he deceived himself not to think, not to realize that humanity, who had only been partially freed by Christ's words and deeds, could and would be completely freed and delivered by his death and resurrection. He thought they would only forever be partially redeemed, not completely redeemed. He thought Christ's death would end it all. Right? But if Satan was deceived, Origen held, it was only because he deceived himself then in these ways. Only then <laughs> to find out. After he had voluntarily released humanity, he found out he couldn't hold Christ either. 
whom he had exchanged, uh, accepted rather, in exchange for humanity. So Satan was deceived, but he deceived himself in this. Uh, Satan lost everything in this transaction. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Okay. A century or so, almost two centuries actually, after origin, Gregory of Nisa formulated a slightly different version of this theory. Gregory's main concern was to protect the justice of God. The justice of God. He reasoned that since the slavery humans find themselves in is their own doing, their own choice to sin, and enslavement to Satan they took upon themselves, as I said, by their own free choice in the Garden of Eden, he says it would therefore have been unjust for God to steal from Satan what was rightfully his. That would be to sink to Satan's level. Consequently, some ransom or liberation agreement had to be agreed upon between God and Satan. <coughs> Gregory taught that it was because of Satan's pride and greed that he therefore accepted the offer of a prize he considered much more valuable than the human souls he already held captive, and that was the life of the Son of God himself, of Christ. He wanted that more. And it was his pride, thinking he could hold that, that led him to accept the ransom payment. So, you see, well, I should say this too. According to Gregory, Unbeknownst to Satan, the deity of Christ was concealed from him. He thought that Jesus was just a man. Didn't realize he was God in the flesh. The Godhead was hidden beneath the veil of the flesh, to use uh, Gregory's words, so that, so that Satan would accept Jesus as the ransom payment. So whereas Origen maintained that Satan deceived himself, they both taught that, that Satan was deceived, but Origen taught that Satan deceived himself. Gregory acknowledged, though, and this is amazing, that God deceived Satan. He acknowledged that. He said there's no other way to look at it. As Gregory himself put it, and I quote the early church father, the deity of Christ was hidden under the veil of our human nature so that as with a ravenous fish, <laughs> the hook of deity might be gulped down along with the bait of the flesh. <laughs> Isn't that a great way of putting it? Okay, so that's what he thought, that, that, that Satan was deceived by God. But though he acknowledged this, that God deceived Satan, uh, Gregory justified that on two grounds. He, on two grounds. He says, first of all, yeah, God deceived Satan, but everyone got what they wanted in the transaction. God got the liberation of humanity, and Satan got the life of Christ. They both got what they wanted. True, he was deceived, but everybody got what they wanted. And second, he says, whereas Satan's aim in the deception of Adam and Eve was the ruin of human nature, the motivation behind the Almighty's deception of Satan was the salvation of humanity. Now, that seems troublingly close to the idea of what? <laughs> A good end justifies any dishonest means. Is that worthy of God? We wouldn't think so, right? We wouldn't think But that's really the logic of his argument. You know... God meant it for good, Satan meant it for evil, therefore the deception was justified on that grounds. The ends justified the means. I think Gregory would have been a great politician. <laughs> <laughs> He's already got all the prerequisites. <laughs> well, here, here's where it gets really surprising, though. In later developments of this, remember, this is, the, this is the reigning view of the atonement for a thousand years, the ransom view. We've seen the first two... Uh, the fountainhead of it on these two early church fathers. But in later developments of the theory, a theologian I heartily admire, St. Augustine, accepted the ransom theory of the atonement. But he insisted, however, that the deception of Satan uh, 
should not be thought of as something God did to his credit. That, that's just abhorrent to me. But only as something God permitted. Didn't cause it, but he permitted it. In a kind of synthesis of the ideas of both Origen and Gregory of Nyssa, Augustine taught, like Origen, he borrowed this from him, that, that Satan deceived himself, his pride. He deceived himself. In which self-deception, though, as Gregory had taught, Satan was a victim of his own pride. And God permitted that. <coughs> now, I can accept that part of it. Right? I, can accept, I don't accept the ransom theory for reasons we're going to talk about later, not as it's formulated here, but I can accept that. At least Augustine cleans that up, right? That Satan was deceived, but God permitted him to deceive himself because of his own pride. That's actually what happened in the Garden of Eden to humanity, right? <laughs> in, in, in one sense. All right. So that's what Augustine is saying. Satan accepted the ransom payment of Christ's blood because he vainly thought that he could overcome and hold Christ, when in reality he had no such power. The fiercest weapon Satan yielded was what? Death. Death. But death, the Bible teaches, is the wages of what? Sin. Sin. And since Jesus never sinned, he was not liable to death. And for that reason, he was not, nor could he be, for one moment, under the power or the control of Satan. For what puts us under the control of Satan is our sin. But Jesus was sinless. He was never under Satan's control. Never. But Satan's pride and greed, according to Augustine, blinded him to these truths. And he accepted the ransom payment. Wholeheartedly accepted it, thinking that he had everything. When in fact it all simply. Very well. That's the ransom theory. And so far, we have examined three theories of the atonement. Let's just review. Three theories of the atonement that state that it was directed primarily at humanity. At humanity. And with three of them. As I said, either as an example of the extent to which we should be dedicated to God, that's the Socinian theory we looked at first. As a demonstration of how much God loves us, that's the moral influence we looked at there, secondly. As a demonstration of God's hatred of sin, but it was designed mostly to turn us back to God in fear that that would happen to us. And then we've examined one theory uh, that holds that the atonement was directed at Satan. And that's the ransom theory in its various iterations throughout a thousand years of history. I want to conclude today, though, by considering a theory that maintains that Christ's death was primarily directed not towards humanity, nor towards Satan, but towards God himself. Mm -hmm. The idea being that Christ died in order to satisfy a principle, a characteristic in the very nature of God himself. This is called, uh, oh, that's the ransom theory there. This is called the satisfaction theory, the satisfaction theory. Now, to understand this theory, a bit of history is required to, de to understand its development. The early Latin theologians, and we talked about them, right? Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Augustine. The early Latin theologians, the church fathers, lived and worked in a society dominated by what empire? The Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire. That colored their entire thinking about life, about the Bible, about everything. Everything. And it gave, and I hope you've already seen that, it gave to their writings a judicial cast. How many times did I say in looking at those theories, they were concerned about the justice of God, the justice, the laws, explicitly in the governmental, but also in the others. That's what they were concerned, that's how they looked at the world, in terms of the rule of law and how it uh, structured society. But by the time we get... Uh, 
to Anselm, who, the Bishop of Canterbury in England, from 1033 to 1109. Well, society had changed, right, over that thousand years. The political structure had changed. And by then, the feudal system, not the Roman Empire, was the most powerful force shaping society and history. And so violations of the law were now thought of not just as against the state, as against government, but they were thought of as very personal violations, offenses against the feudal overlord, right, who ruled uh, that caste society. Then, too, there had been a growing emphasis in the Catholic Church. Now, we're, we're up to, the, uh, you know, we're up to what, 1033 into 1100, right? So we're well into the history of the Catholic Church here. And there had been a growing emphasis in the Catholic Church on the concept of satisfaction, satisfaction being the word. The church developed its penitential system. And it was taught in that system that if you sinned, you had to offer some form of satisfaction to God for that sin. By offering penance, that's the word they use, right? By offering penance, and who decides what that is, is but they, they needed to order, uh, offer some penance. And only then could you have avoid punishment for your offenses. God had his, his anger and his dishonor had to be satisfied. So it's not surprising then that given these changes in society, immersed in this cultural milieu, that Anselm came to think of God as a feudal overlord who to maintain his honor demanded that there be adequate satisfaction for made, made for any encroachment upon his honor. And in developing his theory of the atonement, therefore, Anselm rejected the ransom theory. And remember by now it's been the, the reigning theory for a thousand years, so he's really going against the grain here. But he rejects the ransom theory, flatly denying that Satan had any right of possession over human beings. And to which we would all say, Amen. <laughs> Satan has no rights. Human beings are God's creations, and God's creations alone, he insisted, they belong to God and only to God. Indeed, even the devil belongs to God. He himself is a creature of God, on some point of that. Consequently, God didn't have to purchase humanity from Satan at any price. Indeed, the only thing God owed Satan was punishment for persuading fellow servants, namely Adam and Eve, to follow him in leaving their common lord and offending him. But there was absolutely no necessity, according to Anselm, to pay ransom to the devil. None. None whatsoever. He has no rights. Quite apart from owing Satan anything, central to Anselm's concept of the atonement, is his understanding that sin is basically a failure to render, render to God his due. And, and, and that should ring true to you, because as far as it goes, it, it is. <laughs> failure to give God his due. By failing to give God his due, we basically rob God and take from him what is rightfully his, and thus we dishonor him. Since God, though, is a God of justice, there's that word again. He not only may act to preserve his own honor, he must do so. He cannot just overlook sin without punishing it. Nor is it even enough for sinners simply to restore to God what is his by right. There must be additional reparations made. There must be satisfaction made for the injury done to God's honor. Now, a good analogy of this I read in preparing this is a modern judicial proceeding in which it's not uncommon for a convicted thief to be ordered not only to restore the victim's property he stole, what was rightfully the victim's, but to pay additional punitive damages in addition and perhaps even serve a prison sentence, right? So you go be a satisfaction is made for the injury to the law, not just... You know, I steal a million dollars from you, the, the, the government's just like, I say, we'll just pay a million dollars back. No, satisfaction has to be made to the state and to the victim, right? So that's what he's getting at. But back to our offended overlord. God's 
violated honor can be put right, according to Anselm, in one of two ways. He can either punish human beings, condemn them, or he can accept satisfaction made on their behalf. But by what means can such satisfaction possibly be made? Humans cannot render satisfaction on their own behalf. Because even if we were to do our very, very best, even if we were to offer our very selves back to God, they would, we would only be giving God what is his due order, what, what he already owns. To compl uh, complicate matters further, Anselm held that humans had allowed themselves, through their own choices, they had allowed themselves to be overcome by evil, by Satan, by God's arch enemy. And this was an especially grievous offense. Therefore, whatever satisfaction rendered must include the defeat and the humiliation of the devil as well for God's honor to be upheld. But how could human beings who have already been defeated by Satan, weakened by Satan, how can we defeat Satan? Clearly then, only God himself, only God himself could render the required satisfaction. But then again, this satisfaction, if it was going to benefit human beings, had to be made by someone qualified to represent humanity. So what does that mean? Satisfaction could only be made by someone who is both what? God and a human being. To which we say, Amen. Amen. That someone, of course, is Jesus Christ. Who, as we saw last fall, is both God and a sinless human being. Who did not deserve death. He did not deserve death. So, when he voluntarily died on the cross on behalf of the human race, he went well beyond what was God's right. Well beyond what was required. And for that reason, then, his sacrifice could serve as a genuine satisfaction to God for humanity's sake. Very well. We have seen that Christ's death can be interpreted and has been interpreted in a variety of ways. Perhaps I, you didn't realize that, you know, but it has been throughout history. There's been quite a bit of argument over this, and you can see why. Why would Satan want to confuse us about the atonement? <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. Right? And though we might, in fact, though we do have strong objections to some of these theories, or, or, or to parts of them at least, I want to point out, as is often true in history, that there is a dimension of truth in each one of them, which is what makes them powerful, but it's also, they all are going to flow into the basic meaning of the atonement we're going to talk about next Sunday, God willing. There's a dimension of truth. So we need to be careful about that, and that's a lesson to us. We often hear our opponents and we just dismiss them out of hand. You know, I happen to be a Reformed theologian, and if I hear an Arminian, somebody who believes in free will and that we can just make our own mind up about God, I, and the first thing I want to do is say, leave me, I don't have time for you. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to listen to that argument. But there's often a dimension of truth in those arguments, even if we don't hold to the whole argument itself, that can inform our own thinking. And I think that's true here with these series. Obviously a lot in each one of them, or at least the most of them, that we don't agree with. But there's something in each one of them that is true. For instance, as the Socinian theory holds, in his death, Christ did give us a perfect example of the dedication to God that God, that God requires of each one of us. That is, it is that. When you look to the cross, that is an example of complete love to God, love to the Father, that Christ would voluntarily lay down his life as God's son for sinners. That is an example of un unparalleled love and dedication. It is that. The question is, is that all it is? No. But 
But it is that, right? Wouldn't we all agree on that? If you want to see what love looks like, if you want to see an example of dedication to God, look to the cross. Look to the cross. He didn't deserve death. He knew he didn't deserve death. And yet he bowed the knee to the will of God. That's what we all have to do. All right? As the moral influence theory stresses, in his death, Christ did demonstrate the unfathomable extent of God's love for us. And we talk about that all the time. We say, if you really want to know God's love for you, then what? Look at what Jesus did on the cross. There is nothing wrong with that. That is absolutely true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that his only son died on the cross. It is the, the clearest demonstration of God's love for his own. The question is, is that all it is? No. But as the governmental theory would have it, the death of Christ did demonstrate the deadly seriousness of sin and the severe, unwavering justice of God. It is a prime example of the fact that sin will be punished. It will be punished in someone. It will not be overlooked. It is serious business. And God will maintain the integrity of the moral universe. As the scriptures say, has God said it and it will not happen? No. No. Let every man be proved a liar. God is faithful to his word. And God says the wages of sin is death. And guess what? Somebody's going to die. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. And the governmental theory brings that before us. And that... Uh, that's not a bad, I'm not saying that I believe in the governmental theory of groceries, but that's not a bad thing to remember in our society in which we tend to go to the opposite extreme, right? And think that God is, as we said, I think you said a teddy bear, that God is so loving as a teddy bear, we can just do whatever we want, and he just looks the other way, and he loves us anyway. That's where our society is, and the uh, seriousness of sin, there's a great book out there by Plantinga <laughs> called Whatever Happened to Sin. I don't know if you've read it. If you ever read a copy, it's a great book. Whatever Happened to Sin? That's a good question for modern society. Whatever Happened to Sin? Because in many churches, it's not talked about very much. And if it is, it's talked about, well, we just tried our best and missed the mark a little bit. But God loves us anyway. Just keep on fighting. <laughs> Governmental theory. There's something about that that stresses the seriousness of sin that's, that's helpful. And as the ransom theory, Oh, Christ did triumph over the forces of evil at the cross. And he did liberate us from his power. He did break the chains of Satan, as we say. That's all true. But how he did that, why he did that, to whom the ransom was, all of those are important questions that aren't necessarily satisfactorily answered in that theory. But the basic idea that Christ paid a ransom is absolutely true. And that he liberated us from Satan. What does Paul say? You know, we were citizens of the kingdom of darkness, and he liberated us and transferred us into the kingdom of light. He broke the power of Satan over our lives, who held us in his chains. We were enslaved to Satan. That's all very true. And Christ paid the penalty in his blood to redeem us. That's very true. So there's something in that. And of course, as the satisfaction theory has it, in his death, Christ did offer satisfaction to God for our offenses against him. Absolutely made satisfaction. Each of these atoning benefits, each of them, meets a need in us. Every one of them. But which is primary? Which is primary? Well, God willing, next Sunday we're going to offer an exposition of what we perceive to be the basic meaning, as the scriptures teach it, of the atonement. And it's a basic meaning I think we shall find maintains and authenticates what is good in each of these, the valid insights in each of these theories, uh, but goes well beyond them as well and corrects some of the errors in them as well. That's next. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, real quickly. Um, the burden of Gethsemane and the cup of wrath. How would these men have explained that the cup of wrath was set aside for the Christ, and even he told his disciples, you cannot drink from the cup of wrath, I'm supposing because they were full of sin. Right. And he was the only one who could drink of that cup because he was sinless. Right. So how would these men explain the atonement from that angle? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Well, some of them would just say Christ was, was a human being, like us. And I don't think they would hold that he was necessarily sinless, or even it was necessary that he was sinless. In fact, some of these theories would even say it's a good thing if he wasn't sinless. This is a better example. You know, if he can do it, we can do it. I'm not speaking for all of them, but some of it, some of it goes back to what they view about Christ and his name. <coughs> That's why I wanted to preach on for the last two weeks, uh, First John. That is still the first four verses. Or four, first four verses of that epistle are so mightily important because John reiterates that we've always got to balance that view that he is fully God, fully man in one person. And as you see, many of these theories, where they go amiss. They go to one side of that equation. Christ is only human. Uh, or, but see, but and part of it goes back to what they believe about God, though, too, George, because, see, some of these theories, even the <laughs> governmental view, doesn't see God as some... He's not going to punish sin because he's love. They go too far to the, that attribute of God, mm-hmm. that God is love. So God, even though God is going to drink the wrath, it's not really wrath because it's not punishment for sin. They wouldn't hold to that. They would say, no, it's just a demonstration of God's justice and how serious he takes sin. Which kind of begs the question, if you're Christ, why did I have to die? I mean, wait a minute, couldn't you do that some other way? I mean, to me, if I'm Christ, I'll say, hey, wait a minute, can't you demonstrate that? I mean, if that's all it is, can't we do that in a different way? So that's why we said at the outset, and I know, you know, people get that, their heads spin and their eyes go back in their head, and I don't understand that right. But that's why we struggle with these things. And it's a mighty struggle. I understand that. It's important. But unless you think about who God is, you can get in real trouble unless you maintain that God, yes, God is love. But we see that on Facebook all the time, right? God is love. But that's not all God is. And that's the point. And that's where some of these theories go astray. God is just love. But he's not that. He's also a God of justice. And he's a God of retribution. And he is a God of wrath. He's all of those things. Uh, And Christ is not just a good human being. Christ is a sinless human being. But more than that, he's God, which makes his sacrifice infinitely valuable, as we talked about this morning. And human beings, who are we? What, what you believe about human beings. As I said earlier, some of these guys say, well, we really need an example because we're really basically good people. You know, we've, we've got good hearts. So they don't take sin seriously. I mentioned whatever happened. They don't take sin seriously. But that's really the problem in the church today, period, and in our society. We do not take sin seriously. We do not see it the way God sees it or even try to see it the way God sees it. We see it as just messing up a little and, you know, our permissive society doesn't want to deal with that. We just do not see the seriousness of it. And unfortunately, the church has adopted that approach. We, they don't talk about. They don't want to offend people. So many churches don't want to have empty pews. So they're more afraid of empty pews than empty hearts. They, they really are. And so they'll do anything. They'll say anything just to get people in. If that's what you want to hear, we're, we're wrong for it. You know, because they don't take sin seriously. But then you get to this, and you go, well, what does the atonement mean then? And it means nothing, or it means something quite heretical. Really important. All those concepts, uh, we need to have a good idea about that. Any other word? Quick question. Yeah. If those men, those uh, intelligent men, yeah. believe that, what happened to them? Well, I don't believe destiny? that we go to, you mean a eternal destiny? Well, I don't believe that we go to heaven or hell based on uh, how much theology no. So I can't, I can't answer that question. All I can say is that if they truly trusted in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, they're in heaven. That's all I can say. Okay. That's that's all I can say. It's got. But to answer what eternal destiny, that's way past my pay grade. Okay. So in, in Sunday school this morning, we talked a little bit about. How uh, Satan, not, can I, 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 yeah, hold that. I want you to hold ask that question. But I thought of something else I want to say to you. We can't judge these men too harshly because we've had 2,000 years now to think about these things and to hear other people preach and think, and God give us more and more insight through the Holy Spirit. They weren't perfect, but they most of them advanced the ball in in other ways that we're not talking about here. We're just picking one part of their theology, and they may have been wrong about that idea, but they may have been very right about others. St. Augustine, I think, was wrong in accepting wholeheartedly the ransom theory, but we wouldn't have Calvinism without Augustine. 
because that's what Calvinism is. It's Augustinism, or whatever that word is, <laughs> right? Augustinianism, I think I'm trying to say. Right? That's what it is. Uh, but I think beyond that, it's Pauline also, but, but that's not story. Now, you are going to say something about Sunday school. Well, we were, we were talking about how Satan can use the truth and mix... George might have to help me here. Completion. He, can, okay. Completion. he mixes the truth with untruths. Yes, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So, you see that in every one of these. Uh, yeah, okay, that's where I was going with that. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, you see that in every one of these. <clears throat> yeah, and, and, and I'm not saying that... But, but again, some of it is just that we... That's how we grow. I shudder to think some of the theological opinions I had 20 years ago. I really did. Because I, I, I wasn't 20 years ago where I am today in some of that thinking, and I think I was wrong. I, I pray to God I haven't preached something wrong, but probably have. You know. But as we go, as we learn and grow, sometimes our opinions of things change and grow too. And I, so I think we... We can't judge them too harshly. I wouldn't want to stand in judgment of, of, of their lives um, because they did some wonderful things for the church as well. Origin, for sure, rescued the church and some of the early thinking about some of the other heresies. But uh, they, they weren't perfect, and they were wrong about some things. And part of the problem, though, and I don't want to keep you guys up, but part of the problem was the culture in which they lived. They were really, really, really influenced by Greek philosophy, many of them. And, and so philosophically, they tried to solve some of these problems uh, apart from Scripture. And I think that's where they, they went awry, if I could say that. So we have to be careful about other influences that we have, too. Yeah. Okay, I understand that. I just think and yeah. this, this is so important, what you believe about Christ. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. No, it is. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know about that answer. I, I think some of them were, you know, as I said, there was a grain of truth in what they said. They seized upon a right idea, but as so, so often happens, they went too far with it. They went to they went to a logical end that was not logical, and they just went too far with it. But there was a grain of truth in it. It is true, as the Socinians held, that the cross is a great that the cross is a great example of how we should love God, love God with all your heart, with all. Your heart. We should lay down our lives. I'm going to preach that. I think I just wrote that sermon. I think it's May 5th. You know, I uh, <laughs> preach that. We should lay down our lives for other people. Um, you know, and that's a great example of, of, of Christ doing that in the ultimate way on the cross. There's nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely true. But it's just when you limit the atonement to that that you miss the point. You know what I'm saying? But God is gracious, and I, I, don't, know, I don't know where their hearts are, but. I wouldn't just think so. I would think most of them though, are getting corrected in heaven, but they probably, <laughs> probably are there. Yes. Uh, anybody else? You were going to say. Oh. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. Any other? <laughs> With, are you going to do limited atonement? Oh, absolutely. But we're not there yet. But you said Augustine was part of that. Yeah. Not there. That's you talking about in this class? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to talk about it not next week, but the week after. We're going to talk about the extent of the atonement on May 5th. And that's I don't get that at all. Hmm? I don't understand that at yeah, all. Yeah, well, okay, no. later. Right. <laughs> we'll try to help with that, but uh, I don't know that I can clear it all up. But I'll, I'll try to do my best about it. But yes, there are basically two views of, of the extent of the atonement. Well, there are three views, but one of them we didn't talk about, though we will. Uh, but the other, there are basically two views, yeah. And we're going to talk the pros and cons of each of those and why we think one of them is biblical and one of what the other is not. Or most biblical. Because they're true, they're parts of the truth in, in, the, in, in, in the other theory as well. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. This gets to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? But you're absolutely right, Peter. This is the heart of the faith, and we need to be right in this area. We need to have a firm understanding of what we do in the cross. It affects everything else we do in the church. It affects how we present the gospel to people. It affects how the church is organized and its mission. It affects everything we do as Christians. And it really does. It's not just theoretical. Well, I guess I was going to say, God doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't, uh, it's going to be the right way or it's going to be. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be punishment for sin. Absolutely there is. Absolutely there is. That's the satisfaction theory has it right. He must be satisfied as far as it goes. 
to me, that theory doesn't quite go far enough, so we're going to add another dimension to it next week, but it's part of the truth, for sure. Okay. All right. Well, there will be a pop quiz at the beginning <laughs> next week on those five theories. Be, but it's going to be matching. <laughs> Match the heretic to the... No, I just... God bless you. Amen. Amen.